Uh, I know you have myself 10 minutes, and thank you all for your patience. Uh, I'm the last uh, questioner, so we'll get out of here. Um, Ms. Bobert uh, mentioned this is uh, Donald Trump's birthday and wished him happy birthday. I want to acknowledge that today is National Bourbon Day, and coming from Kentucky, I think that's an important thing to to get on the, on the record, and I will be celebrating appropriately uh, later in the day. Uh, Mr. Mr. Williams, I get Mayor Williams, thanks for, for being here. And you are more than the, the mayor of Union City. You are representing the League of Cities across the country. Um, how many of the mayors that you're familiar with um, think the American Rescue Plan was a bad deal? I know no mayors. Uh, they think the American Rescue Plan was a bad deal. And that's Republicans, Democrats, that's and non Republicans and Democrats. Uh, we are a nonpartisan organization. Uh, so I have no mayors that have reached out and said, I think this is a bad deal, because we worked in concert with uh, a lot of your uh, 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 committee members and, and certainly with uh, the Biden administration to craft this legislation to make sure that cities did get direct funding. Right. And one of the complaints about the CARES Act was that there was not enough flexibility uh, offered, that the guidelines were too strict. And therefore, when we were crafting exactly. this legislation, that's what we wanted to do, was to give the cities and states and counties uh, more flexibility in the use. And so obviously, that doesn't guarantee that everybody will use them for the best possible uh, uh, purpose. But uh, the ranking member mentioned a, a list of things, and once he mentioned, and I know he said there were more that he didn't mention, but didn't amount to $2 billion, which means that's less than 0.1% of the total investments made under the American Rescue Plan. So there are a lot of things that were done really well in my state, and I have a letter which I uh, ask unanimous consent to enter into the record um, without objection. This is from the governor of the Commonwealth of Kentucky talking about all the ways in which they have used, not all of them, but some of the prominent ways. And you mentioned some of them, water systems, broadband. Uh, we made an, a considerable investment in schools, both uh, remediation of schools so they're, they're safer, and, but also construction of schools. That, uh, and, and the point I raise there is not all of the benefits of the American Rescue Plan have been realized. There are many that will be realized as time goes on because of these important investments. You're exactly right. And uh, it was you know, mentioned during uh, my conversation with uh, Member uh, Carter, uh, the Greenway Trail, for, for example, those things take time. You know, certainly this is something that we are uh, engaged in now in developing that resource to our community. But you know, one of the great things that I do see have happened uh, with this ARPA plan uh, is that I am noticing and have noticed, not just in Georgia, in my city, but around the country, that uh, elected officials at all levels have begun to somewhat work together in concert when it comes to the needs of people. Uh, it just concerns me that we still have a lot of this back and forth with a lot of our federal members who uh, chose not to support it, and that's fine, that you're right. But when you think about the needs of the people of this nation, it is imperative that every person that has been sent to Washington to serve their communities, their districts, that they do the right thing when it comes to saving lives. I totally agree. Uh, you know, we know that funding helps states and localities. We've said uh, survive the pandemic and make investments that are evidence-based and community supported. I ask unanimous consent to enter a, letter, enter a letter from Results for America into the record, which makes that case uh, without objection. Um, now I'm going to, one, one question, it was the, this Fed report, the San Francisco Fed report was referenced uh, earlier. What didn't the Fed um, <clears throat> issue a report within the last six months that said they had estimated that uh, the American Rescue Plan accounted for less than 1% of the, of the total inflation, like 0.6 or 0.7%? So I'd have to look, and and uh, I'm not familiar with that report, but there are numerous reports from, you know, there's 12 regional federal reserves. Right. Each has a research staff. All of them are doing research on these things. So if it's of use, I could gather the various reports and, and provide you with those references. Okay, that, that would be appreciated. Uh, there's a recent one now that I'd like to uh, mention and, and uh, enter into the record. This is from Moody's Analytics. Mm-hmm. 
this is uh, decomposing consumer price inflation year over year change through May 22nd on seasonally adjusted CPI, a total of 8.5%. That number has been mentioned frequently. Um, Russian invasion of Ukraine, direct impact of higher commodity prices, 2.8%. Indirect impact of higher commodity prices, 0.7%. So according to this, 3.7%, 3.5%, or almost half actually of the 8.5, uh, they say is directly attributed, directly or indirectly attributed to the Russian invasion. Um, stress supply chains, 1.5%, uh, uh, labor shortages, 0.1%, reopening effect, 0.4%. Um, energy regulation, zero. <laughs> Uh, American Rescue Plan, 0.1%. So uh, I sure, I'm sure there, there are people who will come up with different numbers, but mm -hmm. uh, these numbers are pretty revealing as, as well. And I want to turn to inflation for a minute because we hear a lot about gas prices. M Mr. Moore, do you know what gas prices, the oil price of a barrel of oil was in January before the Russian invasion when Russia was actually aggregating troops nearby? But do you know what it was a barrel? Sorry, January of 2021. 2022. 22, I mean, uh, I don't know, three, I don't know, $3, three fifty. I don't know. No, not, the, not a gallon, the oil, a barrel. Oh, the oil on price. On the market, yeah. Well, I know that the the month that Trump left office, the oil price was about 60 to $65 a barrel. I don't know what it was. And It was in the low 80s. Uh, Wait, are you talking about January of 2021? 2022. Oh, 22, yeah. Yes, okay. just low weeks 80s. before the invasion. Yeah. A barrel, right. a barrel of oil was twenty was eighty to eighty five dollars mm -hmm. a barrel, um, and it's now one hundred and twenty dollars a barrel. Um, it's a pretty compelling evidentiary uh, case that the invasion dramatically raised the in, increase in in oil prices. And everybody wants to say, well, we we ought to have an all all in policy. You just, you just said that. Um, what are we going to do? We're going to tell the oil companies to drill more. You think they'll listen to us? You mentioned 11 million gallons a day. Does anybody else in the world produce as much as we do? Sorry, does, I does any other country in the world produce as much oil as we do? Uh, we're slightly now below. We were the number one producer um, when Trump left office, and we're now um, we've fallen below Saudi Arabia and Russia. I don't and, think so. I think I think Saudi Arabia is 8.5 million barrels a day. I, I think Saudi Arabia is higher than we are, we are. But my point is, when the price goes from $80 a barrel to $120 a barrel, we should be producing 15 or 20 million. I mean, we isn't, should. And isn't it the case that the reason they're not producing more when they have 9 million acres of leases that they're not using right now in the United States, that they make too much money on at $120 a barrel? Why would they go out and explore for oil? By the way, which is not gonna do anything today, tomorrow, or next month, to alleviate the crisis because it takes a long time to drill, to find oil and build those that capacity. And just like the, the Keystone Pipeline you mentioned, how long will it take for that to be completed? Well, that, we've said that for 10 years. I mean, we right. would have it completed if we hadn't cut, continued well, to stop it. But look, my point is that when the price of oil goes up, production goes up. I mean, th these these companies are incredibly sensitive to the price of, well, they make it's every not. additional dollar is an additional, uh, you know, additional dollar of profit for their, them. Their investors are demanding that they don't respond with drilling yeah. and investing. And they, know, and they know that electric cars are coming and it'd be increasing uh, an increasing factor. And to make a long-term investment now in drilling for more oil, more oil is something that in their uh, economic interests uh, and shareholder interests are something they're not. But, but sir, to do. the president says he he wants to. Do, he said he wanted to destroy the oil and gas industry. He doesn't control. He doesn't the oil, want oil and he gas doesn't development. control the oil companies. What's that? He doesn't control the oil companies. He doesn't control Shell. They just took, control they just took hundreds of thousands of acres off, land, off limits. They just did two weeks ago in the middle there of an. Nine energy. million acres already under lease that they have. What Sir, when you talk, they, when you talk to the people in the oil industry, you cannot have a red light, green light, red light, green light policy. You're talking about billions of dollars in investment. You can't say, oh, you can drill, you can't drill, you can't, you can't. Who's, There's so much uncertainty, nobody, they're not going to do it. Nobody has said he can't drill, I, but I, I have one that they can't drill. One other question before um, I conclude my time will be up. And it just just to try and set the record straight, you were talking about the corporate tax rate lowering it under the, the Republican tax plan, which right. you were part of it, and how corporate uh, uh, tax revenues increase. 
What was the rate that corporations were paying before we lowered the tax rate from 20, from 35 to 20? Our statutory rate, when you took account the federal rate and the state and local, were at 40 percent. What was the what was the effective rate that the that corporations? So what we did paid exactly. So the effective rate was much lower. Our plan. Our plan, it was much lower than 21 so percent. This is, this is the essence of a bad policy, right? We had the highest tax rate in the world, and we weren't raising much revenue from it. So we cut the rate, and we're actually getting more revenue from it. Isn't that a better? They weren't, but they weren't paying 21 percent on average to begin with, were they? They weren't. A lot of companies no. were paying zero. They weren't. Exactly. The wind and solar industry have never exactly. paid so a penny of tax. I don't understand your the, claim effectiveness uh, right. on, on that basis, but uh, that's an, uh, probably an argument for uh, for another time. Anyway, uh, my time is up, and uh, we're going to have a vote in a minute. And I, uh, what's that? Oh, they have called votes. So we have a vote. <laughs> anyway, once again, thanks.